Well, thank you very much for the introduction. Good afternoon, everyone. I appreciate the invitation to present this seminar. Uh, what I'll do is uh, very briefly talk about the ethanol industry in U.S., talk about some of the issues related to ethanol industry, some of the emerging technologies. And to start off, um, I'll, I'll, I'll present a DVD. It's about 11-minute DVD that gives you a very nice overview of the ethanol production process. <clears throat> For those of you that don't know me, I'm not the professional golfer. So I'm an <laughs> I'm associate professor in Department of Ag and Biological Engineering. Um, collaborate with several institutions and colleagues, uh, University of Missouri, Ron Bellia, USDA Labs in Peoria, in Winmore, Pennsylvania, and um, another uh, assistant professor at Oregon State and then colleagues here at University of Illinois. Dr. Kantrosh is actually an audience. <clears throat> okay, so this is what, what we'll talk about today, is start with ethanol production video, and then a little bit about the industry, the growth in the, in the industry, some of the issues facing ethanol industry, and then come to the emerging technologies in dry grind processes, and then a little bit about cellulosic ethanol, <clears throat> or what role does that play in ethanol production. Thank you. 
only clean product. The next goal is to pulverize the warm kernels. The hammer mill pounds the grain into a fine powder or meal, exposing the starch that is needed to make ethanol. Next, the meal must be liquefied enough so that it can be pumped. This is the job of the slurry tank, which injects water and a small quantity of an alpha amylase enzyme to begin breaking down the starch. At this point, the liquefied material is called mass. At each stage of the ethanol production process, quality checks are performed. Samples are drawn and tested in an on-site laboratory to ensure that the material is up to production specifications. In the mash state, the grain is now in a form that can begin its conversion to ethanol. The conversion begins with cooking of the mash, which is also known as liquefaction. Liquefaction is the conversion of starch to sugars through the application of heat and alpha amylase enzymes. The mash is pumped through a combination of cook tanks and heaters for one to two hours at temperatures ranging from 190 to 230 degrees Fahrenheit. The high temperature sterilizes the mash by destroying bacteria and other microorganisms. It also eases the process of converting the starch molecules to fermentable sugar molecules. Sugar is the base raw material that will make the conversion to ethanol possible. When the alpha amylase has achieved its maximum conversion potential, the mash is cooled and moved to the fermentation tank for the next stage, a combined process called saccharification and fermentation. The saccharification starts with the introduction of a second enzyme, glucoamylase, to complete the conversion of starch to fermentable sugars. As fermentable sugar molecules are produced, a biochemical process called fermentation begins. Brewer's yeast and nutrients for the yeast are added to the fermentation tank. The yeast metabolizes the sugar and produces carbon dioxide and ethanol. After fermenting for 50 to 55 hours, all of the sugar is consumed and the mash is an unrefined mixture of water, solids, and about 12% ethanol. Many refer to this solution as beer. The next step in the process is known as distillation. The beer is pumped into a distillation column where heat is applied. As the beer boils, the ethanol evaporates to the top of the column as the solids and water falls to the bottom. Distillation continues through three different columns until the process is complete. At this point, the ethanol producer has another remarkable product, the spillage grain. The spillage grain comes from the left upper back, or spillage from the bottom of the distillation column. By moving the spillage through the centrifuge, the solids are separated from the liquid. The liquid is evaporated to produce a syrup, then combined with the solids to produce the spillage grain. Two beef products are made with the spillage grain, both wet and dry beef. The wet beef contains about 65% water. It is conveyed to a storage bag and then loaded onto trucks for transport to local feedlots and dairies. The dry beef is first grounded to a large rotary fryer. This process cuts the water content to approximately 10%. After distillation, the process of creating fuel grade ethanol is nearly complete. When it exits the distillation column, the ethanol is 190 proof, or 95% ethanol and 5% water. To bring this up to 100% ethanol, a baker phase molecular sieve or mold sieve removes the remaining water. The final step is called the injury. In this phase, the thorium based fuel is added to the pure ethanol to a content of 2 to 5%. This renders the liquid undrinkable and outside the regulations that control other distilled products. 
Okay, so that was a, a short video on the ethanol production process. <clears throat> now, this ethanol production in the U.S. is growing at a very fast pace. Uh, from 1980s to about 2000, it was growing at about 80 million gallons increase in the capacity every year. From 2000, it's expected to grow at about 7 to 10 times at that value. So you can see how quickly this industry is growing and how much production capacity is coming online. Right now, we have about 115 ethanol plants in U.S., and about 79 plants are under construction. In Illinois, we have seven plants that are operating and another three plants that are under construction. And I know there are about seven plants that are on the drawing board. So quite a few plants will uh, or potentially will be built in, in, in Illinois. And we need to grow in ethanol production because it has several benefits. Number one, it reduces dependence on foreign oil imports. It extends the domestic supplies. It's environment friendly, increases octane rating, increases demand for corn, stabilizes prices, and rural development. Most of these ethanol plants are coming up in these small towns. And every time ethanol plant comes in, there are, you know, in the plant itself, there are only about 35 jobs. But Related to ethanol plant, there are about 200 jobs, direct jobs, that, that help the rural development part of, the, of this industry. There are also issues related to ethanol production. Some of the issues are water use. There are a lot of numbers on how much water is used for a gallon of ethanol produced. Right now, in a dry ground ethanol plant, we use about four gallons of water for every gallon of ethanol produced. And later, I'll go into a little more detail as to where that water is used and, and um, how we can conserve it. Then there are questions about emissions or odor from, from, from ethanol plants. And then we have the whole debate about food versus fuel. We're converting all this corn, which is valuable food, into fuel. Um, low co-product value, about 33% of the corn becomes DDGS. And I'll go into DDG value. The value of DDG is almost similar as value of corn. So low co-product value. And then energy independence. If we convert all the corn that we grow in the U.S. into ethanol, we only meet about 20 to 25 percent of the total gasoline demand in U.S. Because every year we are using about 150 billion gallons of gasoline every year. So if we convert all the corn that's grown, we only reach about 25 percent of the annual gasoline demand. So it's not the complete answer. It's only an extender of our domestic supplies. Okay, so here's the basic process. When you process a bushel of corn, you get about 2.7 gallons of ethanol and about 15 pounds of DDGS. DDGS stands for Distiller Dried Grains with Solubles. So if you process 100 units of corn, 
about 33% becomes CO2 and is vented out, 33% is ethanol, and about 33% is DDGS. Here's the very simple schematic for this process. We start with corn, we grind the corn to reduce the particle size, add water to make the mash, and then we add an enzyme called alpha amylase that'll break the starch down into dextrins. Another enzyme is added, glucoamylase, that'll break the dextrins into sugars, and the yeast will consume those sugars and convert that into ethanol and CO2. And using distillation, we refine the ethanol, and then we have the co-product recovery to recover DDGS. Like I said, 33% of the corn that goes through the plant becomes DDGS. And DDGS, because it has high fiber content, fiber does not ferment. So whatever fiber that was coming in the corn gets concentrated here in DDGS. And because of the high fiber content, DDGS can only be used or primarily is used as a food for ruminant animals. Here's the breakdown of DDGS utilization from 2002 to 2006. And you can see about 83 to 87% of that DDGs is going for dairy or beef cattle, and about 13 to 17% is going for poultry and swine. So 85% of this material is still being fed to, to large animals. And where are the markets for these animals? All the DDGs being produced in the Midwest right now where the corn supply is. But in order to feed this DDGs, you have to take it to either to Texas for the beef cattle or to California, New York for the dairy cattle. And the cost of transporting this DDGs is about $40 a ton. The price of DDGs lately has been about somewhere between $60 to $80 a ton. And 50% or more than 50% cost of the DDG is just transporting it to the markets where it can be utilized. On the other hand, if we change the composition of this DDGs, if we remove the fiber from this DDGs, it can potentially go for the non-ruminant animals, the poultry and swine. And that industry is a lot closer to Midwest. And transporting to these markets is only about 6 to $12 a ton. So just by changing the composition of DDGs, we can diversify the markets for it and probably get better value for this DDGs. Look at the price of DDGs. In purple is the price of corn, or in green is the price of the corn, and in purple is the price of DDGs. And these are values from Economic Research Service, USDA. From 1980s to 2006, you see that the differential between the DDG price and corn price has been dropping. Lately, DDGs is selling for a price lower than price of corn. Now, what does that mean? That means we sent 33% of the corn through the plant, comes out at the back end at a value lower than the value of corn that went in. No value addition. In fact, you lost the value. And it took 33% space in the plant, so you were spending all this energy heating this material. You know, it, it was hindering with the enzymes to break the starch down and all that. And later on, we recovered it at a value lower than value of corn. So we need to change that. And some of the emerging technologies that combine the plant biotechnology, biocatalysis, and process engineering are changing this process so that we don't have a DDGs that has very high fiber content and reducing the volume of DDGs. Because if this industry is going to grow and double in next few years, we will double the pile of this DDGs if we don't change this process. So first I'm going to talk about some corn fractionation technologies that are being developed in order to reduce the volume of these DDGs and diversify the markets for it. Change the composition enough so that we can diversify it and get better value for it. So here's the first process that I'm going to talk about. It's called enzymatic dry grind corn process or email process. If you process that same bushel of corn through the email process, you recover 3.3 pounds of germ out, you recover four pounds of pericard fiber out, and you recover another four pounds of endosperm fiber. Now, you're only getting 3.7 pounds of DDGs compared to 15 pounds that you were getting in the conventional process. Other benefits of doing this process is that germ does not ferment, neither does fiber ferment. 
by pulling all these non-fermentables out up front, you can increase the capacity of the plant and bring in more corn through the plant. And what you're putting in the plant or what you're putting in the fermenters is more fermentable substrate, more starch. Starch gets converted into ethanol and you recover the protein. So now you have a high protein feed with very little fiber in it and the volume has gone down. And potentially this feed can be used for non-ruminant animals. In addition, from the germ and fiber, you recover other high-valued co-products. For example, from germ, you recover corn oil. From fiber, you can recover these two high-valued co-products called corn fiber oil or corn fiber gum. This oil that we get from the corn fiber is very different from the oil that we get from the corn germ. This oil in clinical studies have been shown to reduce serum cholesterol. It's called compounds called phytosterols. And if you're eating this oil into food products, margarine, salad dressings, your cholesterol naturally goes down. FDA, in the history of FDA, has only allowed 11 health claims from natural products. This was the 12th claim that they allowed that corn fiber oil reduces serum cholesterol. The other product is corn fiber gum, which has properties very similar to gum arabic. Gum arabic is currently imported in the U.S. is about a hundred million dollar market, and you can re or produce this product from the corn fiber fraction. Okay, so you get high valued co-products, but we wanted to see how does enzymatic wet milling process compares with the conventional process in terms of fermentation profile and DDGS composition. So here are the fermentation profiles. We have ethanol and we have the fermentation time. Here is the profile for enzymatic wet mill. Here is the conventional process. As you will see, the enzymatic wet milling process was complete at 36 hours. The fermentation was complete at 36 hours, whereas the fermentation was still going on and went on to 72 hours for the conventional process. That means we increased the productivity of the fermentation. We were getting fermentation complete in half the amount of time as it would take for the conventional process. Why is that? Well, when we remove suspended solids from fermentation broth, which is the germ and the fiber, the mixing of the slurry is much better. And these solids are not hindering with the enzymes that want to break the starch down into dextrins. The heat transfer is much better, and the overall reaction kinetics are much better with the enzymatic wet milling process. When we looked at the composition of the DDGS, here's the composition of conventional DDGS, protein content of 28%. For enzymatic, it was 58%, higher than the soya bean meal. And look at the fiber content, acid detergent fiber, it was 10.8 for the conventional, it is 2.03 for enzymatic. Now you have a feed product that's 70% less in volume 70% less, has very high protein content, very low fiber content, can potentially be used for non-ruminant animals such as poultry and swine. Okay, next I'm going to talk about another emerging technology where plant biotechnology is playing a big role in this dry grind corn process and changing the corn itself that is used in the dry grind corn process to reduce the processing cost or the operating cost. How does this process work? So we start with this transgenic corn, which looks just like regular dent corn, but we don't have to add alpha amylase in this process. The enzyme is already there in the corn kernel. And what the company that developed this corn, the Syngenta Biotech, they have put triggers on this enzyme. That means only when this corn sees high moisture content and high temperature is that this enzyme gets activated and starts to break starch down into dextrins. So now you don't have to add alpha amylase in the process. So we compare this corn with exogenous alpha amylases. So here's our control sample in which we were adding alpha amylase from outside. And here are the three samples in which we added 3% of this amylase corn with regular dent corn, 5%, 10%. Again, no significant difference in ethanol production with this corn. That means the expression levels of enzymes are so high in this corn that you need to add 3% or less of this corn 
with regular dent corn and still get same amount of ethanol produced. The next step was to see what happens if we drop it below 3%. So we did a study and again, 1%, 2%, 3%, no significant difference in ethanol yields. That means you need to add only 1% of this corn with regular dent corn and you don't need to add any alpha amylase in this process. The DDGS composition for the 3% amylase corn or control treatment were very statistically uh, not different, so it's practically the same DDGs that you'll produce from the conventional process. So it reduces requirement of exogenous alpha amylases. Only 3% or less corn has to be added with regular dent corn and no difference in DDGS composition between 3% amylase corn treatment or the conventional treatment. The next technology is biocatalysis. It's changing the enzymes in the dry grind corn process. And recently they have come out with raw starch hydrolyzing enzymes. This technology has already been adopted in 17 dry ground ethanol plants in the US. How does this work? Is we start with corn, we add water, and then we add alpha amylase and glucoamylase in the conventional process. With these enzymes, you don't have to add alpha amylase or glucoamylase separately. You don't even have to do liquefaction step, the heat transfer step. All you do is add this enzyme, raw starch hydrolyzing enzyme. You don't have to do, do the step. You throw in the enzyme, you throw in the yeast, and start to convert that starch into glucose. Because this enzyme can bind with granular starch. It has a starch binding domain. It binds with granular starch. You don't have to use high temperature to liquefy the starch into dextrins. This enzyme is being produced by both major enzyme companies, Genencore and Novozymes. And these enzymes have very high granular starch or raw starch or native starch hydrolyzing activities and can liquefy and scarify starch into glucose at temperature less than 48 degrees centigrade. In conventional process, we have to heat the slurry at 104 degrees centigrade. So right there is savings in the energy cost. So we compared the fermentation profile of this granular starch hydrolyzing enzymes with two combinations of conventional dry grain ethanol enzymes. And you see, there is no significant difference in ethanol profiles for these enzymes. The difference really came in is in the glucose profiles, is that you get very small amount of glucose peak with this enzyme compared to the two conventional enzymes. And that is very good, because high concentrations of glucose cause osmotic stress to the yeast. So if you can maintain very low sugar concentration in the fermentation, the chances of infections are very low. Secondly, the yeast is much more healthier in the fermentation process and produces less cholesterol, which is another you know, side product that's produced by the yeast to relieve the stress or maintain the redox balance. Here's the composition of maltose, flat line compared to the two conventional enzymes. Maltotriose, again, a flat line compared to the two conventional enzymes. DP4s, these are degree of polymerization 4 or higher. Again, a flat line compared to the two conventional enzymes. So final ethanol yield with granular starch hydrolyzing enzymes is comparable with conventional. Glucose maltose peaks are consistently low with these enzymes, and they work at the same temperature conditions as conventional SSF. Now you can do liquefaction, scarification, and fermentation in just one vessel, one unit operation. Okay, next I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the issues in the dry grind ethanol industry. First one is the water used in dry grind ethanol plant. Like I said, for every gallon of ethanol produced, you will use, depends, changes from companies to companies and what kind of water rerouting they have in the plant. Typically, you will use somewhere between 3.5 to 4 gallons of water for every gallon of ethanol produced. Most of the water that is coming in the plant is used in cooling towers. About 70% of the water coming in the dry ground ethanol plant is going to cool the fermenters. About 22% of water is what goes into the process. And that water that goes into the process is mandated by the, the, the regulatory agencies. And that's the water that's going in the CO2 scrubber to scrub the CO2 that's produced during the fermentation process to remove any acetaldehyde, formaldehyde, acrolein, or any of the volatile organic compounds 
in that CO2 that you went out. And that water from the CO2 scrubber is then rerouted within the process. Very small amount is actually comes into the cook tube or the cooking tank. About 10% of water goes as reverse, uh, reverse osmosis and that goes as a boiler feed. Whatever steam that's used in the plant, about 80% of that steam is actually recovered in the process. So you only have to make up. The makeup steam is the water that's going into reverse osmosis for the boiler. So it's a very tight process. About 15 years ago, they were using about seven to eight gallons of water for every gallon of ethanol produced. There are some engineering consulting firms that talk about reducing that water requirement from four gallons to about 1.5 gallons of water for every gallon of ethanol produced. And they're talking about maybe removing the cooling tower, the wet tower, to a dry tower. But I haven't seen that yet. It's just so far, some presentations made by engineering consulting firms that builds these uh, dry ground ethanol plants. Talk about emissions. Every ethanol plant is now required to put a regenerative thermal oxidizer. Is anything that is vented out has to go through this RTO to burn any volatile organic compounds. So right now, there are very little emission or odor problems in dry ground ethanol plants. <coughs> Now, a little bit about food versus fuel debate. We hear a lot about corn being used for making fuel. Actually, it should be food and fuel, not versus fuel, because we have to figure out a way of making food as well as fuel. Look at the corn production and the use. The supply has gone up as well as the total use has gone up. But both of them, you know, have gone up over the years. So really, there is no supply or demand issue here. Secondly, look at the growth of all the other demand compared to fuel ethanol demand. That demand for fuel ethanol in the last 10 years has grown to about 500%, but everything else, food, feed, export, that hasn't changed. That is only 3.9%. Of all the corn that's produced in the U.S., only 11% is going for food. Right here. Only 11%. Rest is all in the feed or export markets. So very small portion of the corn that we grow in U.S. is actually going for food. And as far as the feed is concerned, dry ground ethanol process has a feed product that comes out. The DDGS in a conventional process. Finally, the future of ethanol. As I mentioned, if we convert all the corn that we grow in the U.S. into ethanol, we only make up 25% of the total fuel demand in U.S. So obviously, corn is not the answer for this biofuels. USDA predicted that corn can be used for making ethanol up to about 14 billion gallons, maximum 15 billion gallons. After that, cellulosic has to come online because then if we go beyond 15 billion gallons ethanol production capacity, then we will start to dip into the food and feed market. But up to 15 billion gallons, there is no issue. And right now, we are close to the total capacity that we have is close to about 8.9 billion gallon, including the plants that are under construction and all that. But eventually, it will go up to about 12, 14 billion gallons ethanol production capacity. So cellulosic ethanol has to come online, and that can be from the wood chips, switchgrass, sugarcane, bagasse, corn store, cotton woods, or municipality waste, paper. I think that's all I have for this seminar. Thank you for your attention. I'll take any questions if you have. Yes. How big an infrastructure problem is there with the existing plants or ones that are being built today um, are you talking about cellulosic or the, the ones that I talked about the earlier, you know? Sure. Yes, most of them are add-ons, or you can retrofit an existing plan to do these technologies. For example, raw starch, changing from conventional enzymes to raw starch, it's only a $3 million extra capital that you have to put in in a plant, and you can convert it from a conventional to raw starch fertilizing enzyme. 
as far as the enzymatic dry grind process, recovering germ fiber up front. For a, for a 50 million gallon ethanol plant, that's about $11 million in capital and goes up front, front end of a dry grind ethanol plant. So you don't have to change the process that you have. You build an add-on module in front of this dry grind ethanol plant to do this recovery. As far as the transgenic corn is concerned, there is no change is that you just stop adding alpha amylase in your process and you don't have to change anything else. As far as the cellulosic feedstock is concerned, that is a very different process because the pretreatment is different, the, the hydrolysis is different, the sugars that are produced are C5 sugar, or I'm sorry, yes, C5 sugars, xylenase and arabinase, and, and, and the fermentation of the organisms that are used to ferment those sugars into ethanol is different. So that is a very different process. And we're talking about another whole series of it's, You can probably combine it at the very back end where you're doing the distillation and the ethanol loadout and all that. But all the upfront, you know, the coming in of the feedstock and everything is, is very different. The pretreatment, the, the scarification, the fermentation is all different. Yes? You mentioned that all corn together could be about 20 to 25 percent of gasoline. Right. Does this include all the efficiency improvements that are possible in the next? No, no. This is just simple conversion of you know how many billion bushels of corn we produce. For every bushel of corn, we get about 2.7 gallons of ethanol, and you do that. You know, that's how I arrived at the number. How, how would you grow with technology? Well, I'm using the current technology that gives you 2.7 gallons of, of ethanol for every bushel of corn. But yeah, there are some technologies, you know, some advances, you know, using high fermentable corn and all that. You can probably increase the number of gallons per bushel of corn. And then when you start converting the fiber into, into ethanol, that adds some more. But, you know, that might take it to maybe 30% of total gasoline demand. But that does not include, include the increase in the yield per acre of the corn hybrids. Yeah? Yeah, about the uh, energy input and output. Uh-huh. There are several disputes about the uh, corn ethanol compared to gasoline. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I read some uh, articles that are talking about it's a negative, <coughs> and other articles uh, talking about it's a positive, a little positive, a little negative. Mm -hmm. Sure. Most of the negative studies that have come out are from Dr. Pimentel from Cornell. Okay. Yep. Yep. And in Berkeley, Ted Patsik. USDA has very extensive studies. Okay. And they have shown, and these are all published literature. One was recently published in Science Journal. They have clearly shown that ethanol gives you about 70% more energy every all the energy that goes into producing a gallon of ethanol, that includes harvesting the corn, the, the gasoline you burn in the tractor, transporting it, converting that into ethanol. All the energy that goes into a gallon of ethanol, you get 70% more. But let's forget about that, okay? Because it's a very wrong debate. Do you know what the net energy balance for electricity is? It's only 35, 40%. Are we gonna stop using electricity? It's a very valuable form of energy. Same thing, liquid fuels are very valuable part of energy. Okay? You cannot burn a, a kilo of coal in your tank. You need a liquid fuel. So this whole debate of net energy balance is a wrong debate. But as far as ethanol is concerned, I can tell you there are several multiple papers in published peer-reviewed journals that have shown previously, about four years ago, it was 34%, but some of the recent advances in dry ground ethanol process, right now it's about 70% more energy from a gallon of ethanol that goes into producing that gallon of ethanol. Does that take into consideration energy for uh, fertilizer? Everything. It includes the energy for fertilizer. Everything is included, yes. And, and, and very recently, the best paper that has done that is very recently published in Science Magazine where uh, the authors looked at all the studies that have been, including the ones by USDA and and Dr. Pimentel, and also the one from Berkeley, and they clearly show that their, their assumptions are wrong. 
Does yeah. it also include the net balance of carbon emissions? Uh, yes, if, exactly. The recent study from Crutzen and other, other the, the, the carbon balance, and that paper also talks about the carbon balance. When you take about gasoline, it's net you know, positive in carbon, the amount of carbon you're producing. Ethanol is just break even, not, not that great. But cellulosic ethanol, in terms of carbon reduction, looks out much, much better. Yeah. In the uh, modified corn use, what was your control? Was that the enzyme? It was the enzyme that you'll buy from enzyme company and then add it from outside, compared to the corn where you didn't add any alpha amylase. It was already there in the corn. Yeah. Between what? Wet grind. Oh, wet milling, you mean? Yeah. In wet milling, what is done by big companies like ADMs and Cargill is that they'll take everything apart and then use the starch for ethanol production, but you can also use that starch for glucose production or high fructose corn production. It will go in beverage drinks and all that. So you're recovering everything, and then you take starch, which can go either for fuel production or for high fructose corn production. But that industry has not grown. It's a very capital expensive process. Okay, a hundred million gallon dry grain ethanol plant and a hundred million gallon wet milling ethanol plant, the difference in the capital cost for wet milling is about, you will spend about 250 to 300 million dollars, whereas for a dry grain ethanol plant, you'll spend about 75 to 100 million dollars. Uh, so it's one third the capital cost. And that's why in the last 15 years, we have not seen any expansion in the wet milling industry in U.S. And all the expansion has been in the dry grind, primarily for that reason. The part of water consumption, the part of water usage, which we talked about four gallons per month, how does that compare to wet milling? Uh, wet milling you use for every, let's see, um, for every bushel of corn, you'll use about seven to eight gallons of water. That's roughly the number. Um, I think for every pound of starch produced, you use about 2.3 or 2.5 pounds of water. So you can back calculate it. But it's, it's pretty high. It's a very water intensive process. Yeah? That four gallons, where, where does it go? Where, where does it go? Um, most of that water is recycled in the process. It's, it's in the fermentation wet because you maintain about 20% solids. But whatever leaves the plant goes out from the, from the stacks. It's exactly. Everything is dried down. Sometimes, well, most of the plants now are, are selling wet feed cake. You know, you saw that in the video. It only has 35 <coughs> to 40% solids. So a lot of water goes out as a wet feed cake. But that has a very short shelf life and you cannot transport it long distance because you're transporting water. Yeah. So if you have a feedlot nearby, um, you'll take it over there and use it over there, uh, and you'll use it very quickly. And within a week, it'll start to go bad. So if you dry it down, then it's a very stable product, what, is, what we call DDGS, and that can go you know, long distances and can be stored six months or more. I'm really not into animal nutrition, but I can talk a little bit about based on the work we have done with animal science here. It's considered a very good feed product, you know, because of its high um, um, protein content for for ruminant animals, for dairy and beef. In fact, in dairy, there are some some issues with the the quality of the fat, and also in in non-ruminants, there's concern about the belly fat for the for the pigs and things like that. But I'm really not into that area, so I'm not going to speculate too much. Yeah. There are. There are a lot of, like I mentioned, there is an engineering consulting firm that talks about reducing the overall water requirement dry ground ethanol plant, and they are talking about capturing that water that leaves from the stacks and using a dry tower rather than a wet tower but the capital cost really goes up when you do that. So, But they're talking about reducing it to almost 1.5 gallons of water for every gallon of ethanol produced. Yeah? 
Um, some plants will have a, a lagoon, but not every plant. And, and there is, I mean, there is no backpipe in a dry ground up process. The only water that leaves the plant is this water right here that comes off from the green sand filters or maybe reject from the reverse osmosis. But this is the water that never touches the process. So there are two kinds of water in the plant. One is the non-contact water and one is the contact water. All the contact water is right here in the process. And that water stays in the process or goes out of the stacks. The only non-contact water that we have in the plant will come out from the plant, uh, either from the green sand filters when they pull out the water from the water well. It's going to go through the green sand filters or the reject from the reverse osmosis. Little bit sometimes boiler blow down is vented also out. But most of the plants, the boiler blowdown will go back into the process. How about the water blowdown from the cooling it also go, it also leaves the it also leaves the plant because there's some mineral balance, so they, they don't use it. Because you, you said that the same plant that is uh, that somehow water is consuming cooling power, so it means that it could be consuming silicon and water in cooling power process is two gallons for evaporation. For the blowdown, yep. Mm -hmm. And in the process, well, if you bring more water into the process, you'll disrupt the 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 ethanol percent, final ethanol concentration. And and the lower final ethanol concentration, you have more utilities you need to use in order to dehydrate that ethanol. So really, you don't have any more water that can come into the process. Already with the CO2 water that's going into the process, you're reaching about 20% or I'm sorry, 32% solids concentration in the fermenter. So if you bring any more water, you'll just dilute your fermenters down. Oh, you mean, oh yeah, treating it and then putting back into the process? It's a possibility. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, I heard at one plant when they pulled out the water from the well, the quality of water was so bad that they were already out of specs. That they couldn't use that water, well water that was coming out of the tank. So it really depends upon what kind of well water you're put, pulling out. If it's very clean water, maybe you can use the cooling tower blow down back into the process or back into as a non-contact water. But yes. Well. Some plants will just put it into their lagoons. Some plant will just give it back to the city for the treatment. What is the price of the E85? Oh, I, I don't know. I'm sorry. <laughs> I don't know what price of E85 is. Well, you can check. I think we have a, we have a gas station right here on 1st and Green Street. Yeah, they're, they're selling E85. I, I think it is. I think it is. It might be even cheaper than, than a gallon of gasoline. I don't know what the exact price is. Yeah? I'm not familiar with gasoline terms, but I'm confused by one thing. It's talking about the ethanol having higher octane. Uh huh. And yet, I've also heard that E85 gas gets a lot less miles per gallon. Well, that's just the BTU value. You know, the overall BTU value of ethanol is lower. Uh, than gasoline. It burns cleaner because more oxygen is there, but the BTU, the energy value of gasoline or uh, ethanol is lower than gasoline. Yeah. So you get more miles per gallon? A little bit, yeah. Mm -hmm. What are the waste products in this process? Do they have lagoons or there must be other waste products besides? Only water, only non contact water that goes into that lagoons. Everything else either goes into DDGs or wet grains or goes out the stacks. Process water is does not go out from the plant. All the process water is used within the process or goes out with DDGs or whatever goes out the stacks. It's all vented out. There are very few plants that are actually recovering CO2. 
and using it. The markets are very, very small, so only a couple of plants can flood the market. How much is the carbon Like I said, you know, if you're using 100 units of corn, 33 units will come out as CO2. Is most of that in the energy heat process? It's just the fermentation process, you know, if you... It comes from the corn process. Exactly, yeah. Mm -hmm. Is there any studies to reduce the Yeah, it's a, you know, but this is the only pathway known for last, I don't know, several hundred years, you know, to convert, you know, carbohydrates into, into ethanol. Any other questions? Well, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Singh. Thank the, you. Uh,